Part of the. Also, um, we can use this instead. If you want. I don't know that it's big enough, though. Oh, okay. um, Well, for all the. But it certainly is nice. Uh, well, it's a little bit of a cut. 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 Well
Well, do we, for roll call, I mean, typically, do we have to actually roll call each thing, just as long as we know that everybody is here? Okay. Uh, I, I make a motion to approve our agenda. Got a second? A second. Okay. It's approved for today. Uh, Friday, May 31st, I'm uh, going to discuss new business. First items up is going to be the election officers. As far as what that pertains, I believe we have a chair and a vice chair uh, and a secretary. I'm prepared to go over the duties and responsibilities. I was hoping uh, I can get some assistance in that part. Yeah. But we, we, can, we can get it if you don't have the right thing. Well, I think that was part of the um, presentation. Oh, <laughs> I, I like exactly that. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not. It's not? But no. Okay. okay. It's you know, the, the chair is uh, it's off now. allegedly it's on. The chair is the person who um, I interact with the most. So we do um, kind of a monthly briefing before the meeting to kind of go over things that are going on. Um, so they have a lot more interaction with the office than the rest of the commissioners. Um, if there are conversations that need to be had in public with the media, they do public comment on behalf of the commission. Um, they also might interact with um, council. Vice chair might do that as well um, on behalf of the commission. I don't know why it's blurry. It's, there's never been an issue with it before. Is it plugged in all the way there? Damn broken. <laughs> That's clearly what happened here. I mean, I don't even know how else we could come up with any other conclusion. There's nothing on the computer itself the last time. Maybe if we move the tables back, it won't be so. Oh, yeah. That's pulled so tight. Right. Yeah, at least that. Tall. I'm not going to make that happen. Looks like uh, we'll yeah, Michael is the tallest person and closest yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to need this table to do it. That's why we have a 30-year-old. 30-year-old. Nope. There should be an... Is there another one? The, on the is lens, is there something that you can turn? Or? turn. I'm not seeing it. Try try that again, just for the heck of it. No, that's not. That's oh, right. There, 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 there we go. Did, Did you try it again? See. All right. See. Yeah, you can tell you the done work. You jumped up there. I was like, fine. You see how that works? Table's gonna tip over. I mean, my back. Yeah. Somebody else would have crawled. The the secretary takes the minutes of the meetings. Um, that's kind of the rules of those different. Patricia sets the agenda. The commission does. The commission is, is any particular person or commission responsible? Is that the chairman's responsibility? They, they usually discuss what's going to be on the agenda okay. the month before at the meeting, and then staff does it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, can we talk about maybe the time commitments for each? Chair has a lot larger time commitment. So if something were to, like let's say there was an emergency and we need to call a special meeting, I would contact the chair and um, have them see if we can get a special meeting set up. Um, if there's something going on, like somebody wants to complain about us in the office, <laughs> they would contact the chair. Okay. Um, so the chair, it, it is maybe like, I would say, four 
And then as far as secretary seems pretty straightforward. It's mm -hmm. in the meeting we're taking the vice chair uh, interacts with the public. Is that the extent of? Vice chair is kind of, they step in when the chair is not available. Okay. Um, or just assist the chair. So it seems like by far the most engaged position with the chair, uh, yep. even in comparison to the vice chair. So um, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I don't know what what the stance was. Uh, so I, I will do this, and then whatever the repercussion is, we'll, we'll get repercussions. But I'd like to make a motion. I think. I'm sorry. Um, um, there has the commission, commission issued a resolution stating that they were not recognizing the three appointments, and that has not been rescinded, and a new resolution hasn't been issued. The commission submitted. The four so, people sitting here. No, so that hasn't been rescinded by the four people sitting here, and they haven't issued a new one. So I think until they do that, I don't think we should be. I think until that happens, we don't have clarity of the status, or until it's ruled on in court. Um, I, I don't think that, that would be at the commission's 24. discretion. No, that would be at the commission's discretion. No, well, they would have to put that on an agenda, though, and if they wanted to rescind that resolution <laughs> or issue a new resolution. So uh, that would have to be an action that's taken. Because we did, did we know that last time? Yes. But we couldn't do anything until this meeting? I mean, if you wanted to, you could have, but there was no discussion of putting that on the agenda. So we just have to remember to put that. In yeah, I think the plan was to put it on the June 11th meeting. To, it, it, to deal with the resolution or and things like that. Yeah. But, so, with that being said, at this point, I would like to move for Michael Riendo to be chair, Ruby Mateos. I don't know if these all need to be separate motions or not, but if, if we can do all a, com a combination motion, Michael Le 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 Riendo to be chair, Ruby Mateos to be vice chair, and then I'm not making myself to be secretary, unless you want it. Now, how did you come to that? You just... <laughs> just right <now. laughs> no, right now, it's only the four that are recognizing the four of us. Oh, no, I just... Yeah, I that's really... Quite so, so I, I still have the, the recognition piece. I mean, I'm, I, I'm beating a dead horse, and I'll keep beating it until been contacted by the mayor, by the city attorney's office, by the city council, uh, confirming that I am. So, so where's the, and again, you probably hash it out last meeting, I wasn't here, and I apologize. So where's the issue about my appointment? We did not and, and we um, hash that yeah. out. That. We did not hash that out. That's an issue that we reserved um, to, I would say the June 11th meeting is probably mm -hmm. the meeting to kind of deal with a lot of it. The first meeting we had, we didn't, we didn't accomplish anything. On uh, the second, the first official meeting we had, all we, we were able to do was to get into this agenda, get the training. We wanted to get the training done, so therefore everybody has training from either the city and from the commission, or both. Um, at this, after this is over, everybody will have training. Um, so then June 11th, we were hoping several hearings would be done. Um, a lot of matter. We hope uh, part of the hope was some of this stuff will be resolved prior to that meeting. But if it's not, I think the commission can deal with the resolution. Um, we'll put that on the agenda. Deal with the resolution at that time. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that we had plans. We haven't got to creating a new agenda yet on our current agenda, but that is part of the part of the issue. And we, my understanding, we could, if we could always change officers later. Mm -hmm. As well. There we go. Does that help clean things up the room? No. <laughs> and you know that. <laughs> you understand that. But that's fine. That's fine. It's not, uh, I'm not going to keep being. If you want, we could discuss that. Yeah, I'm not going to keep well, I, would, I would make something. Yeah. I would make this comment. Um, the director asserts that that resolution is binding. Others of us would disagree that it has any legal force. Um, however, from your comment, it sounds like if the commission formally, in proper order, were to uh, uh, discontinue that resolution, 
you would then accept as commissioners and work with Pat. I don't. I, and me. I think that there has been some miscommunication with you. I don't have any role in deciding who is recognized as a commissioner. So if the commission issues a resolution, I, as their staff person, I have to do what they say because I work for the commission. I don't get to unilaterally decide that I'm not going to abide by what I've been told to do by the commission. So then the question is to the commission those accepted. If the resolution uh, is submitted and it's passed, then the commission would accept Lee, myself, and Pat. Right. That's right. a question that I'm asking the commission. That's the understanding? That's my understanding. My, my, my understanding is that the commission does not determine who the commissioners are. But that's the mayor and the city council to do that. So that's my concern with this. However, I'm also interested in seeing the work of the commission be able to go forward. And uh, so what I would understand your comment now to be is that if the four commissioners who you are accepting as legal commissioners uh, were to unwind a resolution, you would then work cooperatively that, with the seven of us. That has been the comment that I've made the entire time. Yeah, I think, so. I think yeah, it, there's a lot of misinformation, but I think what's yeah. on the table is, as far as Latrice is concerned, her prior bosses gave her a resolution that they, that she was directed to do. Okay. Her new bosses, we'll put this on the agenda, we will give her a new resolution and I think that will resolve. The mayor has made an appointment, and she just has, right now, she has contrary directions, right. quite frankly. So I think this could, that's why we're trying to do this piecemeal. I think we can resolve a lot of this, um, and I think we are. I think we're making some progress. I agree. That's fine. I, uh, I to be quite frank, I've got a lot of things in place, so I don't need to be here. My, my presence has no impact. Excuse myself, and uh, once we get the resolution resolved, I still want to support the commission. Still looking forward to serve in, in this role, but if uh, my presence here today will have more impact, I will have lunch. Would you find the training at all that uh, we can, If I'm not a commissioner, we can get it later. If I'm not accepted, I'll, we'll get it later. We'll, we'll work out. Thank you. Thanks. And, and I echo uh, Randy's <laughs> position as well. Thank you. So, is there any comment on the election? Oh, yeah, oh. I guess <laughs> Michael, you want to call for a second of my motion? Let's I'll second it. it. Yes. And that was for um, Phil Swoop, correct? Correct. Okay. Let me give those for everyone. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Aye. I would request, given the dispute about the legality with the individual commissioner's votes be recorded, um, I will abstain I since there's uh, still dispute uh, from voting, so. um, but that way, however it ends up getting resolved, if a majority of those who are resolved to be truly commissioners have supported the motion, then there shouldn't be any dispute about its validity subsequently. So, um, the next item is the language. Is everybody started? We think we've maybe taken too much time on that. I had a video I wanted to show that I found very interesting, but it was a little hard time to watch it. Um, How long is the video? An hour. Oh. <clears throat> I was planning for this to be an hour. That's um, So, can everybody see this or so on? Yes. So,
So the commission was formed in 1962 to enforce the Death Court Civil Rights Ordinance. Um, and we prohibit discrimination in areas of credit and education, employment, and housing, and public accommodation. So our 12 protected classes here are race, color, religion, creed, sex, national origin, age, marital status, gender identity, and sexual orientation, familial status, and physical and mental disability. And I'm sorry, did you want to say anything? Okay. Armando is our new employee, so I was having him participate in the training too. So who we are and what do we do? So we are an impartial and law enforcement administrative agency. So we investigate um, and initiate discrimination complaints. We mediate complaints. We provide education and outreach to the community. Uh, we have seven commissioners who serve without compensation for a two-year term. We have four full-time staff and one part-time staff. So the topics that we'll go over are what does a civil rights complaint look like, the role of a commissioner in a civil rights complaint investigation, commissioner's ability to garner support for civil rights enforcement through outreach and community activities, and interactive portions. What are interactive portions? It's towards the end of the training. Uh, so the PCRC's complaint process has two main parts. That's investigation and mediation. So we start with mediation as a dispute resolution tool. As soon as the complaint is filed, we offer the parties an opportunity to mediate. It's also available throughout the investigative process. If the complaint settles in mediation, there's a mediation agreement signed by myself and the parties. Um, it explains what they're supposed to do and when. There should be usually relief for the complainant and relief of the public interest. If anybody has no idea what these terms mean, um, and those are members of the public as well. If you have questions. Um, then there's the investigation portion. So we do interviews with parties and witnesses, request production of documents, we do on site visits, we subpoena documents and individuals if necessary. A complainant and a respondent need to provide evidence. Um, those complaints are closed with either no probable cause or a probable cause decision. So the first thing is civil rights complaint. Um, we have to have jurisdiction. So um, we have to have um, we have subject matter jurisdiction and then we have territorial jurisdiction. So it has to be some territory within the city of Davenport. Um, it has to be something that is covered under our area of law, under our ordinance for employment. That would be that would include labor unions and temporary employment agencies. Um, for housing, rental, lease, purchase of housing, or financing, and anything involving residential property. So a uh, common misconception with housing coverage is that if it's uh, like if it's commercial property, it wouldn't be covered under our housing ordinance, but it could be if the uh, uh, financing is secured by residential property. Public accommodation, so that's basically services offered to the public for a fee, but also government entities, education, it gets self-explanatory, credit, and any entity providing credit. So timeliness has to be 300 days from the date of incident um, for public accommodation, credit, education, employment. For housing, it has to be within one year. If it's a continuing violation, uh, the statute of limitations begins on the date of the most recent incident. So if it's something um, where there are just continuous uh, things happening, it can go back beyond the 300 statute of limitations. So if something occurred before the 300 day statute of limitations, it could be brought in um, as a viable allegation if it's a continuing violation. Are you going to talk about an example for credit later on? Like what's the example that you, do you guys see credit at all? Never. Never. Okay. Never. Um, I, we've not had one since I've been here. Okay. Um, um, and I'm not sure that there has been one in the last 10 years because if it's, I don't even know if we've had lending ones for housing, even though I'm not familiar with that terminology. He, he said, oh, he's, do we have complaints filed based in the area of credit? Um, what is and what is not a basis for a complaint? So the coverage are the protected classes, obviously. 
it has to be an adverse action. So harm is happening or is happening in the area of employment, housing, public accommodation, education, or credit based upon or because of one or more of the protected classes as defined under the law. Um, or harassment, standing alone without a basis is not covered, but has to be harassed if that's based on a protected class. Um, generally, needs to be more than one incident, and the respondent knew or should have known about it and failed to address it. What constitutes harm? So, something that um, would affect the terms of condition of employment or housing. So, for instance, um, let's say someone complains about discrimination and then they are transferred to a new location um, because that's the resolution that the respondent has come up with. That would constitute harm because they have been moved for complaining about discrimination. Um, another thing would be getting fired or uh, being demoted or think it's something that would affect the terms and conditions of your employment. Okay. Or Any kind of negative impact. Yeah. It can't be something that you just uh, don't like. It has to be something that mm -hmm. has an impact. Um, what is this not? So the statutory civil rights enforcement doesn't include issues of bad management, a bad landlord, general weakness, unfair treatment based on factors other than protected classes, such as veteran status, um, for criminal background, I was, um, not a definite, could be a race claim because of the um, disparities in the criminal justice system, source of income. So just because something is unfair doesn't mean that it's unlawful discrimination. Um, the personal relationships between friends, neighbors, if it's not adversely affecting housing or other protected areas. So sometimes you might have um, people who have personal relationships in a workplace environment, and people say, well, they, you know, they let their friends do X, Y, and Z, but they wouldn't let me do it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's based on protected class, it could just be based on their personal relationship with that person. What is the role of an investigator? So the investigators are objective and partial investigative people, this body. They don't represent either party. The challenge with being an investigator is you have to give good customer service without taking sides or implying acceptance or statements as facts. So one of the things that I joke about <coughs> when people talk to me, I nod just to acknowledge that I hear them. And uh, when I started out as an investigator, I was doing that. And we did a training with EEOC, and they said, make sure you don't nod, because people think that that means that you're agreeing to what they're saying. And I'm like, oh, no. Do you know what information is needed to file a complaint? So this is the cover page of our complaint form. So we need your name, address, and phone number. Name, address, and phone of the business or individual who the claim will be filed against. The date of the alleged discrimination. Where the discrimination occurred. So do you have an issue with people who are um, maybe between homes? What address do they put down? They usually will give us an address to send it to. So sometimes Is that acceptable if that's not their... Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes they, um, people who are homeless work with social service agency, okay. and they'll just give the address to the social service agency and or the acceptable. general delivery mailbox. Yeah. Okay. So the stages of investigation are initial, intermediate, final stages. Initial investigation is when interrogatories are sent out, general questions specific to the complaint, the request for production of documents that are sent out. Interrogatories are submitted by the respondent and the complainant. Is there a limit? Are we going by state statute as far as the limit of interrogatories or is it unlimited? This is uh, for the you mean like questionnaires for witnesses? Yeah, like if you're sending out the interrogatories to the uh, do you send it to the employer? I would assume. This so, is just the parties. Yeah, so if you send it to the employer, is there a limit of how many? Are you going by like the limit, the state limits, like normal rules of procedure, or do we have like a limit that we can you send 50 interrogatories to an employer, or are you limited to? Oh, no, that's not how, no. This is just those two parties. This is the parties who it's filed against. Okay. This is the complainant and then the parties they filed against. That's who the interrogatories go to. Yeah, but I'm saying is there a limit number that you can, the interrogatories you can send to that person, to the party? Because usually, like, I guess, in For litigation. For example, it's a business. Yeah, in a business, like, you have a limit of. I think you mean witness questions. You're talking about witness questions. You're talking about when we send out information from people who are not named parties, right? No, even the, even, even the parties, like a <clears throat> plaintiff defendant. Mm -hmm. um, like, if I send interrogatories, I'm suing the 
a company. And I have, I can't remember what the stat was, it was like 22 or something like that. So I have, I can put 22 questions to them. Oh, we have to answer. and we don't usually, I mean, what we send out is a request for information. So they usually send us back the information that we have requested. So we might ask for their policies. Oh, so these are not things they answer under oath. That's when I guess what the interrogatory is. They answer, if I say, uh, how many employees do you have? They put 50 and they sign that document, that is an uh, under oath statement at that point. You could use that later on if yes. they went to court. They usually send back a position statement, though, okay. instead of mm -hmm. sending us it. They have an option of sending us the interrogatories or sending a position statement okay. with the documents that are requested. Mm -hmm. okay. Like, sorry, I, wasn't, I thought you were asking who we send it out to. I'm like, no, just them to. No. <laughs> you mean how many questions we're asking? Yeah. Um, the intermediate stage of investigation, we contact witnesses. We then start asking for more specific documents. Um, ask why, find the answer. So we want to, if somebody has an allegation, we ask for documents that are specifically related to that allegation. We would do on-site visits, review files, look at court records, other third-party institutional information. So if we're told that this is an industry practice, that something is handled that way, we might investigate that industry to see if this is really an industry practice that things are handled that way. Um, we would do a rebuttal interview with the complainant regarding the respondents' defenses that they put forward. We would investigate those defenses. We investigate the complainant's rebuttal. Um, some agencies use a fact-finding conference to define those issues, determine which elements are undisputed versus undisputed, and determine whether there's a basis for settlement. We don't do that. Final investigation is where we review all the information collectively, and uh, we find answers for any pending questions that are left out there. Uh, we look at, is the conclusion obvious? Do we need more information? We might subpoena a key witness if it's necessary to obtain a statement. Sometimes we've had cases. At the end of it, it's like we don't know which way to go. But there is one person who someone says knows it all, and that person has not responded to a witness questionnaire. So and you're talking people. to that person, not us? Or do we talk to these people? No, the commission has a role, role in the okay. investigation. This is staff. Staff. I don't participate. I supervise the investigation, but I don't participate in the actual in the investigation. Group. Well, we um, only have one investigator, correct? And that's Armando? No. Armando is part-time investigator. Uh, okay. That's Michelle that does um, all areas except housing, and Cody does housing. Okay. Uh, to file a complaint, the complainant only has to allege the confession elements. Um, so the complainant just has to um, make an allegation that would be a violation of the ordinance if it's proven true. There must be evidence of the respondent's defenses or de legitimate reason. So the respondent can't just tell us something and then we say, oh, that must be, gotcha, it's true. <laughs> must be evidence of the reason or defense set forth by the respondent is rebutted by the planet. So is that true or is pretext? So if the respondent sends us reasons and the complainant rebuts and says, no, that's not true, they're lying because X, Y, Z, we have to then go and find that evidence to show whether or not the complainant's statement is accurate or supported by evidence. When the investigation is completed, that's when I get the uh, case, and then I write a uh, finding on it, so it's either probable cause or no probable cause. The standard of proof for civil rights cases is uh, preponderance of the evidence, or more likely than not. Um, when we issue, when I issue my decision, that's considered intermediate agency action, so it's not final action. So um, finding if it's likely that the allegations are true, that that goes um, for a second opportunity for conciliation, and then if it fails, it goes to the commission to decide whether or not to take the over here. For no probable cause, which is the PC appeal rights, and the PC enforcement procedure, if it's a no probable cause decision, the complainant can appeal for reconsideration to our office or to the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, um, or they can appeal that to the judicial court under 17A procedures if it's closed. Um, Typically, do they appeal with you first, or they do, do they go to the Iowa? If um, the, we don't really get any appeals for no probable cause decisions. So we try to make sure that we do a very thorough investigation and explain exactly why there was no probable cause. Um, so that usually gives the complainants a thorough understanding of why it wasn't found in their favor. Um, 
So yeah, we've had a couple that have appealed through our office. Um, one we had, um, it was a PC that the commission closed based on Based on an issue that the, that the respondent raised, so the commission decided to close it instead of taking it forward to um, public hearing, and then it was appealed to EEOC, and they went forward with uh, enforcement proceedings. So for PC finding, there's a mandatory conciliation. Have to participate if it's unsuccessful. Um, it goes to the commission to decide whether or not to take it to public hearing, if it's appropriate or reasonable. So usually cases go to public hearing if there is a public interest to justify the cost and staff time in participating in it. If it's housing, it has to go to public hearing. Um, so our ordinance states that we then step in as their attorney and we have to proceed with taking it through enforcement proceedings. So if the commission decides yes, proceed it goes to public hearing if it's no then it's administratively closed and the parties can um, proceed with enforcing their rights through district court representation in the investigative process so we have contact with the parties obviously if there's a representative party communication is handled through their attorney unless the attorney authorizes direct communication with their client on substantive issues regarding the complaint Sometimes we get clients who are represented contacting us with procedural questions and we'll answer those, but we don't actually talk to you about this. Um, contact with witnesses, unless it's a management level employee who's capable of binding one of the parties, uh, we contact them directly. With managers, we go through uh, their attorney, and this is for the respondent. Contact with former employees, we contact those through them directly. So obviously all complaints filed with our office are confidential. So the challenges that we have in maintaining confidentiality uh, is ensuring that we receive an entry of appearance prior to discussion, discussing a case with an attorney. Um, sometimes we get attorneys who contact us and say, I represent so-and-so and you know, I want you to tell me what's going on with the case. But we can't speak to them about a case unless we have an entry of appearance on file. Uh, when the parties contact us directly, we don't really know who they are. Uh, people just say, my name is so-and-so and I have a case. Uh, no idea if that is the actual person calling. Sometimes the mayor wants to know about a case. So-and-so contacted me and said that they have a case. We, we can't talk to any of the elected officials about cases filed in our office. Um, somebody might come up to you at the store and say, oh, you know, you work at the commission, I have a case with them, and, you know, and start just going to town with you about the facts of their case. And, we're not allowed to talk to them about it, so we just you're in the headlights. Um, the role of a commissioner in civil rights investigation is pursuant to the ordinance. So the commissioners don't have any role in the investigation process. The cases come to them after the investigation is complete, um, and then it's going through the procedures to decide whether or not to take it to public hearing. Oh, I love my binder. I'm going to get it so we can go over the binder. Um, the commissioners are ambassadors for civil rights and for civil rights enforcement through local agencies. Uh, so they do public relations stuff. We um, enlist our commissioners to go to community events, fairs, to sit in at booths, um, do public speaking, participate in advocacy group meetings, boards. I does that with DCAP, um, NAACP. Uh, we do things through local action agency, independent living centers. We participate in community discussions on uh, topics such as racial tension, dispar disparities in administrative services, services tackling division and diversity. Um, so maintaining the middle line. Do you all believe that we are advocates? Our commissioners are advocates? I definitely see the middle line. Um, I don't know here. There's that gray area between being an advocate and <coughs> headhunting for for discrimination topics. How do you find that balance? How do we as commissioners find that balance? I'm going to speak about discrimination in 
know, workplace environments. Mm -hmm. But how do I approach that without coming off and saying, I believe that you're discriminating in your workplace? Alan is probably always, you don't want to do that? Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. But, Let's hear um, from everybody, though. Do we feel like the commissioner serves advocates? And then I'll answer your question. Sure, I believe. I think advocates for justice. That's what I'm looking at it as. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think, I think they the, represent the community. I think the commissioners are advocates for it and for the ordinance and mm -hmm. compliance with the law. Mm -hmm. um, as far as speaking to a specific uh, entity or, or instance to say, I think this is a, I think what you're doing violates the law. Of course, right. Um, yeah, has okay. us stepped into a, a different role mm -hmm. because if someone were to come and file a complaint about that same incident, then they would, um, the, the party would feel like, well, I'm not going before a neutral body because they've already made statements about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes into um, another area we'll talk about a little bit later about the duty of other commissioners. If you hear a commissioner say or do something, um, the requirement to say something um, about it in the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, because if there are statements made that convey bias, um, there need to be contemporaneous statements indicating that that's not the position of the commission to make sure that there is an, um, there are no allegations of a lack of impartiality. Or, uh, and I think that that goes back to being able to have courageous conversations that we talked about the last meeting. I think people don't want to have uncomfortable conversations. And so, when people say things, we are probably more stunned than anything that they have said it. <laughs> and so we don't say anything in the moment, but um, in this role, it's important to say something in the moment or else that could be the statement or sentiment can be imputed upon the other people that are sitting on that board or body. So in the idea of using uh, public speaking as a way to serve as, as an advocate, how would that subject, how would that manifest itself? We bring it to you, or we bring it, we discuss it amongst ourselves. So, like, like if you wanted to do a training. Yeah, yeah, as an example. So, um, it probably would be good to bring it to the office to say, I'm doing a, I want to do a training on this topic. Mm -hmm. Can you review it to make sure that it's accurate? Mm -hmm. um, and then we could do that, or we have trainings that are already created. We usually don't ask commissioners to do trainings. Okay. Um, because people ask very specific questions in trainings, and the commissioners don't always know those um, answers to those specific legal questions. And sometimes people, I've been in trainings where people start giving me examples um, that are pretty egregious, and it's very clear that they're indicating that that's happening where they are. Um, so it's important not to have a, uh, take an opinion on it, by the way. So, um, but if commissioners would like to do trainings, we can definitely set you up with um, either training materials that are already created or create new ones, or if you have some, we can work with you and make sure that they're accurate and that they have all of the information. Thank you. Um, so some of the things that the commissioners do is they sit at booths at community service, community services, and employment fairs. Um, the public kind of likes to see commissioners sometimes. Um, they work with elected representatives of council, state legislators um, on doing things with the ordinance or change of legislation. So this commission is a quasi-judicial and quasi-legislative body um, because you have the authority to issue rules. Um, we actually got our, we, the commission voted on rules um, a few months ago and we got it approved by HUD that they are okay, uh, but we might make some additional edits to the rules and then bring it back to have it approved again. Mm -hmm. um, what are these rules? Like the commission has, so um, independent agencies have rulemaking authority, so the rules state how the ordinance is going to be implemented. So um, because the commission has that authority under 17A, um, you are a quasi-legislative body, so the council is our legislative body for the city. Um, but commissioners who sit on boards, such as the Civil Rights Commission, um, have the authority to issue rules for the ordinance. So oh, that okay. makes it a quasi-legislative body. 
Um, and because you issue opinions on decisions affecting people's rights, you are also a quasi-judicial body, um, kind of like a court. Does that go back into the area of need to be sworn in? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And how does that process begin? It's, it's supposed to be done by the mayor. It, it can I also be done by the chair, though. Okay. It can be done by another board of commission member, yes. Okay. But I don't think any of uh, the board of commission members have ever done that, and I think usually it's done by the appointing authority. But either way, it sounds like if it's not done one way, we can do it. Yeah. Well, not, I guess the rules that you're referring to, them, how are they recorded? Mm -hmm. So we, ha we didn't have rules. So we worked with uh, the University of Iowa Legal Clinic in drafting rules, because they are, it's quite a few of them. I don't send you all a copy of them, but they, um, I think we're gonna make some edits to them because they were, we were hopeful that we could get a new ordinance passed, but I don't know that this is the uh, climate for, the new, <laughs> the new ordinance, so we might amend out those portions that relate to the portions of the ordinance that are aspirational. But we don't have it, because I, I, I didn't remember no, seeing no. Okay, we don't have it. They, they have not, so what happened was the commission approved the rules. Because we have contracts with HUD and EEOC, they have to approve the rules too. <coughs> so we sent them out to HUD and EEOC, and they have approved them, and so now they have to come back to the commission for a final approval. Now, who's looking at the rules to make sure they're not contradicting or overlapping our ordinance that we already have in place? We look at them, okay. um, and then could the commission... We being the commission? Them? Okay. Yeah. Um, and the um, staff at the legal clinic did it. So the director of the law and policy clinic did a vast majority of the legwork. Um, okay. To, uh, a couple of years of working with them again, drafted and finalized to make sure that they are not contradicting one another. Yeah, um, that's a big that project. Be, yeah. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. No, no it wasn't. <laughs> but it, it's easier to read through them than it was to draft them, but it's 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 a substantial uh, reading of that. Do we have, or do we maintain a list of events, annual events or monthly events that occur? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do we get access to them? Um, we have, they are recorded on the annual, the um, monthly report, how many of them we do. Um, and then the housing related ones, those go to HUD as part of our quarterly report. But, and they're usually on the director's report. For, beforehand, though. Mm -hmm. Is so it it's possible? for us to attend to it. Yeah. Oh. Is it possible to get like, a usually, calendar of what events are coming up? We could set so those things, but they're usually on the director's report. So like if there's an upcoming event, I usually put it in new business on the director's report. And then invite your commissioners to it. I think some of them we put on the Facebook site too in the past, in upcoming events. Not all of them though. Not like, like let's say we do a, like this. I mean, this isn't, we don't post that. But like if we're doing a big event, we post it. Speak, um, sorry, Petra. Speaking of, what are the channels that we should be subscribing to? So, Facebook, is that something that we as commissioners uh, should actively be participating in, or should we gather our news and information from, I from guess. staff to send it to you. Yeah. And if it's like let's say the Fair Housing Symposium, we staff plan that with um, the help of maybe like four or five volunteers from the community. Um, so we had to ask the commissioners to come in and help us set up and get everything up and going. Yeah. Um, but we send out emails about that to keep everybody informed about stuff like that. Stuff that we need help with we usually reach out in advance and say, hey we're doing this can somebody chip in? If it's um, just in a, just a training that we're doing, like our Race the Power of Illusion, stuff like that, it's usually on the director's report to the group that when we talk about it at the meeting. Um, so like our Fair Housing Symposium, that's um, the thing that I passed around the color of law. So last year was the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. It's the first year. Oh. Um, and we brought in um, the author of this book, The Color of Law. So we were his only stop in Iowa. Uh, and he came and talked about his book, um, the importance of having that information. He's actually on the video that I wanted to show. Um, but 
those are the kind of events that we would host. That was a huge event. Um, and so it took a lot of staff time, so we don't do those all that often. Uh, the Race of Power of Illusion trainings, we had commissioners come out and help with that, participate in that. Um, a lot of the trainings are just helpful for commissioners to attend, because it gives information that might go beyond um, the knowledge that you have, just in your individual expertise. Peace in the Parks events, so every year we do events in the parks, um, and we ha ask other city departments to come out so that people have an opportunity to interact with other city departments, kind of outside of the city, so that it's uh, kind of a low-stakes environment, so that people can interact with their neighbors, um, kind of build stronger communities. Uh, and we ask commissioners to come to that. We usually get two or three to come to that. Um, our school supply drive, we ask commissioners to help with that. A lot of times our commissioners donate to it. Um, and help participate in handing things out. Press activities, which can help that. So, next we go into the actual learning part. Um, so just to provide a basic understanding of fair housing, equal employment, public accommodation. Like I said, we don't get a lot of credit complaints. We don't have a ton of education complaints, but we <coughs> Is it because lack of knowledge for the community that that's available to them? Credit. Or or, yeah. I think people, you don't know if you've been discriminated against in a credit transaction. So if you apply for credit, you don't know that someone else who doesn't look like you was approved. And so people never, um, it, it, usually the people who are subjected to credit discrimination are those that are on the cusp. So they could be approved and not be approved, and it, it doesn't really come as a shock to them that they've been denied. Um, but what we see with credit discrimination, because there are HUMDA data reports to look at housing discrimination and for mortgage decisions. You can look at it and see that, oh, this person had the same credit profile as this person. They're in different protected classes. The white person, white male person, was approved. The white female was denied. But they have the same credit score. Sometimes the female will have a higher credit score and she'll be denied or offered different terms. So she might be offered a mortgage at a 8% uh, interest rate and a male with a lower credit score will be offered a mortgage at a 6% interest rate. Um, and it, it lets you see kind of their income and all of that so that you can do an accurate comparison. Um, that would again be one that would go under housing, but we just don't get, most people don't know how to access that data. And it's so complicated to get, like, it's hard for us to get in and figure out all of the data. So for other people, it's even harder. Because you've never, like, I don't, have you all ever heard of on the data? You know, like, yeah. um, <laughs> what's the stand for, though? I don't Housing Mortgage Data Act, I think. Uh, actually, they, they have something at the Putnam for that right now. Like the Putnam, the display of race in the, I think they yeah. had some yeah. numbers on that, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Home Mortgage Data or something but it's it takes so much to even get into the system and then to figure out how what things to click to provide the exact information you're looking for you need a training even to figure out how to get into it and look at the data so most people don't know um, yeah I, th I think it's it's mostly that they don't know that they've been discriminated against um, but a lot of it is not knowing that this is a resource because we don't get, mm -hmm. we have like no funding for advertisement and outreach. Um, so usually most of our outreach, I do that after hours, just to kind of get the word out of our, we've been in the news a lot lately though, so that's helped us with a lot of complaints. But um, usually it's, people don't know that we're, we're even here. Right. So a lot of times people say, I didn't know that this was something that I could file a complaint about, you right. know, now. So with us being in the news a lot lately, we've got a ton of complaints. Inundated us because we're understaffed, but it's helpful to know that that information is getting out there. If you have a chance, um, and you're sort of new to this, I know you're not. Just play the terminology you use. This book does an excellent job of giving you the history and the actual behind the scenes as to what is happening. And even though I've been around it 12 years, I did not know yeah. until I read this of the manipulations that go on that most people would not know of. So it's a really worth the time, take time to read. Yeah. 
it will give you some insight that is just amazing as to what goes on. And he, um, that's he's. It, I'll send out a link to the video, and then you all can watch it in your own time. But he did a training for us at HUD. Um, him and Sherilyn Ifill, who's the the legal director for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and it was for like mostly HUD attorneys and FAP Fair Housing um, Administrative. But we're a FAP agency, administrative partners. So um, we are all doing fair housing work, and most of us are attorneys or just well versed in the law. And none of us had any idea that that stuff had happened. I mean, we were just like, what? So the federal, as a as a thirty thousand foot overview, the federal government took very specific intentional actions to segregate communities and to create income and wealth inequalities, to uh, remove investment into um, central cities, to make sure that people were um, stuck in areas that were racially homogenous. Um, some of the examples that he gave were um, during World War II, men, were, the white males went off to war, and so that left uh, brown males and, and white females to work in factories. And so while they, the, I think the example was the UAW, the United Auto Workers Union in California. So while they were working in the factories, they started a union. And so when the males came back from war, they were like, okay, now we want our job here. And, and the union had these, these rights that was said, no, you can't just remove us, you know, without any sort of, <laughs> you know, you, you have to have a reason to remove us, you, you can't do this. And so um, they tried everything to fire these people and couldn't. So what they did was they got support for the federal government to move the plant 100 miles away. And then they built a new like suburban neighborhood around the plant. And then they excluded black, Mexican, I think Native American people from living in this neighborhood. And if if any of the builders of these neighborhoods were to sell a house to these people, and the federal government would not insure the loans. And so the UAW said, okay, so if you don't want to um, insure these homes, you're not gonna sell them to anybody else. So the union <laughs> got together, and they would, anytime there was an open house, they would come and ruin the open house, make sure that the houses just didn't sell. So then the union went and found a, a lend, uh, insurance company to insure the loans. Then the city stepped in and said, okay, well we're going to make sure that you can't run plumbing to these homes. So there's, no, there's going to be no septic system to these homes. So then they figured out a way to get, uh, to connect it to the city's plumbing system. Then the city created an ordinance that said, no, we're not going to allow you to, I mean it was just step after step after step of how local, state, and, local, and federal government worked together to make sure that they kept communities segregated um, through the housing market. And housing impacts every other area of life. So we do do a lot of focus on fair housing initiatives because fair housing directly impacts your employment, your financial stability, all, lots of other areas of life that we don't necessarily think about when we think about home ownership. And within the city of Davenport, 81% um, of black people in the city of Davenport are renters. So black people have the lowest home ownership rate in the city of Davenport of any race. Um, even when everything else is equal, they have way lower home ownership rates. There's also like a drop off for income for black people within the city of Davenport. So there's definitely some racial discrimination that's going on within the city of Davenport that we can see from the numbers. So those are the, some of the things that we have, that might be a project that we have a volunteer work on. Um, information like that. So we did, last year we did a state of equity um, and we had a, a student from Bender High School who came in and prepared that for us. And I'm actually going to have a meeting after this to go over it with a community partner um, just to kind of go over what things we can do to work on these disparities that we see in these areas. So, all right. I do have to leave. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, no, I'm going to have to keep So, I mean, you know all the stuff we've done. Recognize if your rights have been violated. Gain an understanding of the role of civil rights commission members. <coughs> so, the brief overview.
I'll take it as a legal advice or an exhaustive coverage of the topic. So we think about why these things are important. They're important if you plan to buy a house, rent an apartment, work, buy goods or services in the community. You just want people to know their rights. So first example is you are a single mother with two children. You find the perfect apartment. It is so warm in this room. Mm -hmm. I'm like, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you make an appointment to see it, you bring your children and the landlord points out the busy highway nearby and that the kids might not be safe. The landlord suggests another, I know the, the picture is covering part of Complex. The yeah. And said that would be safer. What would you do? We think that's a violation of the ordinance. Why would it be helpful? Well, I would want to know where the apartment is that he's suggesting <clears throat> to see if it's a lesser type. I don't know uh, if it's as nice as the one she wanted to see. Yeah. With just this information, it's hard to decide. Discrimination. Yeah, you know, if, if, if he's sending her to a, you know, it might be, uh, uh, you know, for the kid to be playing around the highway as opposed to going in, in a dumpy place or, you know, where it, she's not safe being outside. I would need more context. Uh, is it his complex? Yeah. The other one? Or is he just trying to get her to move to someone else completely? I think we just we have to do more investigation. When you say what will you do, asking me as a as I'm the mother? Do you, do you think it's a violation of the ordinance? I think um oh I'm sorry, I was reading the question down below. What would you know? I don't know, I guess I don't I don't see the the violation on his face. Yeah. It's Insufficient information yeah. for me to decide on that. This is a violation of the ordinance. <clears throat> this is called steering. So the landlord doesn't get to decide where you're going to be safe. Um, and the landlord should not be making decisions on which unit you're going to rent based Especially on your, your familial status. So you as a parent get to decide, this is, I think this is a safe place for my kids to be. So, um, I think the word for me is suggests. But that's still steering. So the landlord could say, I have a and some of it is uh, people are, sometimes it's just genuinely somebody being nice and saying, I have another unit that has a, a playground, mm -hmm. you know, for your kids, and we have more kids there, and your kids might be able to have more friends there. That's still steering. That violates steering. Steering. How do you spell that? Steering. Oh, steering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's <coughs> the kind of thing where there's training for people who are becoming landlords or landlords, right, so they understand why what might be could be a nice gesture, is still wrong. We, we talk about it in our lead training with the police department, but uh, if landlords want to get training, they would contact us for training. I may be mistaken. I was thinking the city does have a periodic landlord training for the obligations of landlords. Would this kind of issue get addressed if I'm correct? That training is happening? It's a lead training. Um, but we don't go into in-depth things. Usually the question is, the questions that they have about renting are about reasonable accommodations uh, and service animals. So if they have a question about a specific thing, they can contact us for training. So do you do training for landlords too? Okay. We do training for anyone within the city of Davenport. If they want a training, we'll do it for them for free. Okay. It's outside the city of Davenport and then we charge and then the, the fund for that goes toward our school supply drive. So how do we how do we reverse that then? And say instead of coming to us for training, how can we do more outreach and say we do more staff. Yes. Um, it's we um, had a couple of landlord groups that were more um, closely organized that would reach out to staff, mm -hmm. um, but now I think that they have reorganized a bit, okay. so they don't reach out to us as much um, anymore because I think the person who was over died, um, but. I mean, the, some of this information is available on our website. It's definitely available on the Iowa Civil Rights Commission website. Mm -hmm. It's available from HUD. So if you were to Google this, the answer would be there. Sometimes it just helps with people to be able to call and ask somebody a specific question. 
but we just we don't have staff to do outreach. So when I started, we had um, two more staff members uh, that were funded through HUD, and one of them did outreach. And so her job was like finding people who would benefit from trainings from our office, and then she would go ahead and do those trainings. But right now we don't have that, so I do all of the trainings, and they're usually after hours. Uh, example number two: You're searching for an apartment, and your son has a disability and requires a service animal. During the application process, the landlord tells you they don't allow pets. The landlord refuses your application. We think that that's a violation of the ordinance. Yeah, thank you. But I only really know this because I've talked to a few landlords recently. So. <laughs> <coughs> yes, it is violation of the ordinance. No, I, I, I had a question about this because I do, I understand it's a violation. Um, my concern, I think, and I, what I've heard is that people are using all types of animals as their support animal and they're not required to necessarily provide proof that this is a support animal. Um, do you see in the future, when you go to conventions and when they're talking about it, I mean, do we see like, the pendulum kind of swinging back a little bit because you may have somebody who has a, chin, a chinchilla who says it's their support animal, but they're not taking care of the chinchilla. You know, things are happening to the landlord's property um, because of the chinchilla. And it seems like it's kind of, it's way, way swinging toward the... So those are two different issues. So if there's an issue with a service animal or support animal, uh, damaging the property or not under the control of the owner, yeah. that's something different than allowing them to have in the first place. But so you still have your regular rules about your unit um, and allow these people to have a service or support animal. So I my understanding though, they tell, I, and tell me if this is wrong, that they can't even charge a pet deposit for no, this. No, you cannot, because it's not a pet. Not for service exactly. animals, different from pets. So I mean, that's kind of the rule that <coughs> landlords usually would have, is that you can have any pet you want, but you pay me $500 extra. So now, what is their recourse to find out later that the animal has destroyed the, the unit? They would have to sue them for damage yeah. for the unit. Um, if you are allowed to charge people for having an animal for their disability, you're basically charging them a fee for their disability. Yeah, yeah I understand. I just It seems like that's, that's, a, that's an area that's going to get really messy. Um, or it's already really messy, I should say. I think it upsets people because they believe that people are abusing the system, but it is not for them to decide if somebody is abusing the system. The, system yeah. um, the, uh, the purpose of the law is to ensure that people with disabilities are getting reasonable accommodations. And so if they have a disability and they need the accommodation, it should be given to them and they should not have to go through a very onerous or complicated process to get the accommodation. Um, so there are things that the landlord can ask for to ensure that it is that they have a disability and that there's a disability related need for the accommodation. But yeah, I think mostly from what we see, it's a concern about whether or not the person actually has a service or support animal or if this is just their pet that they want to label as a service or support animal. And that's not an area that the landlord should be going into. Because yeah, the landlords are definitely approaching it the incorrect way. But I think the probably correct approach is that sometimes you are treating, I would treat somebody who doesn't have a disability <coughs> completely different than somebody who does have a disability. And as I think that, that decision of where that accommodation is an accommodation or not, I think that's, there's more law that I think is going to develop on that later on. I think the... You, you're supposed to be treating them the same. Exactly. <laughs> so you're giving them an accommodation, like let's say you don't, in this example, you don't allow pets. So the accommodation is to allow this animal to be there because this animal is not a pet. And so they're not subjected to your no pets policy. That does not change your requirements that the property be kept in a certain way. So as long as you are still treating them the same way that you're treating other tenants, a violation doesn't occur. It occurs when you say, no, I'm not going to allow this person to be there because they have this support animal, or I'm going to go and check every day because I know that they have this animal there, and I'm going to make sure. So if you're not checking everybody else's unit, going there on the downs, you shouldn't be doing it for this person just because you know that they have a support animal. No, no, I agree. What happens when the landlord gets cute and says that anybody who has a non-human 
living in my unit has to pay this. <laughs> it's still it's still discrimination. It's a, is it discrimination though? If it's I, if I, they're I charging for a this, support, but they would charge everybody. Yes. That yeah, for landlords. landlords. But that's an animal that's not. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I just think it's, I think it's going to develop. I mean, I understand what the law is, but I just think it's going to develop more. If it's an, if the animal is an accommodation under the Fair Housing Act, then you can't charge the people for it. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I get what it is, but I'm just telling, I'm just, I guess, having conversations. Is that in it's writing good. that the, it's a support animal? You, did you say that, that anybody could come in and say, this is a support animal? It doesn't, yeah. there's no requirement that it be in writing, that it's... Well, then, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's no required for proof. I mean, and I think that's, I like, that's what I'm saying. I think that right now, that's the way the law and is. But I do believe that's going to change as time goes on. And it's not that it's not a requirement. So the landlord is only allowed to ask if you have a disability and if there's a disability-related need for it. And they can require verification from someone who's knowledgeable of your disability or from a health service provider that you have a disability and that there's a disability related need for the, for the animal. The landlord could ask. But they cannot ask about what your disability is. They can't um, delve into uh, exactly what training this animal has to conduct the service that they think that you're receiving. Uh, discuss whether or not this is an appropriate accommodation for your disability that all goes beyond the um, authority of the landlord. But that's the one that's usually the hot topic for landlords. Yes. They are having an issue where they feel like people are ordering things offline to show that, it, and, and there is no training requirement under the Fair Housing Act, so it's not required to be a registered service animal, uh, and it could be any animal. Yeah. So you can have some uh, emotional support goats and if it violates the city ordinance to have goats, then the city has to give you an accommodation to their ordinance um, because it's an accommodation. No. But that's, I mean, that's part of the, us having the conversation, which you challenge us to be able to have, which I don't know if everybody understands that. That's part of the conversation. Yeah. And that's a lot of the, that's the role of the commissioners in understanding what their personal feelings and thoughts are versus what the law says. Exactly. And so it's, I might not agree with this as an individual, but that has nothing to do with what the law says, and we have to comply with the law. Exactly. Um, you are an African-American person, and you answer a newspaper ad for an apartment. The landlord tells you that the apartment has already been rented. Oh, and leave for reference, this is the interactive part, sorry. Um, you learned from a friend that the apartment was not rented, and the landlord later rented it to a white applicant who answered the same ad. Is this a violation of the ordinance? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. This is a black and white. <clears throat> well, it used yeah, to be a radio commercial, commercial that, that did this. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I forgot what station it was, but it came on. Oh, for our office? I don't know. I wonder if it was. This was Trump's first federal investigation. <laughs> So, since 1991, more than 70,000 units of multifamily housing have been made accessible to persons with disabilities through litigation brought primarily by DOJ and private nonprofit fair housing organizations. Since 1988, dozens of cases alleging redlining and discrimination by mortgage lenders have resulted in close to $1 billion in compensation to victims of mortgage lending discrimination and for investment in communities. There were 28,843 complaints of housing discrimination in 2017. The three most common types of complaints in 2017 were disability, race, and familiar status. The biggest obstacle to fair housing rights is the federal government's failure to enforce the law vigorously. And this is from um, National Fair Housing Alliance, from their 2008 Fair Housing Trends Report. So what is fair housing? the right of all persons to apply for and be considered for the housing of their choice in the neighborhood that they choose and, afford, and can afford. It applies to all housing transactions, so rentals, sales, leases, subleases, loans, appraisals, insurance, and zoning. One of the things that we've been hearing at HUD trainings is that um, there are some disparities in how appraisals are being done. So if it is a um, majority-minority neighborhood, Houses are being undervalued 
or they are being valued at exactly the purchase price, um, which is considered a violation of the Fair Housing Act. That might, again, be one that people just don't know is a violation of the Fair Housing Act. So prohibited behavior is the refusal to rent or sell, steering, which is requiring or guiding a tenant to live on a certain floor or building because of children, could be because of disability, they might look at someone and say, well, we don't think you'll be able to do the stairs here, so why don't you choose a first floor apartment? Mm -hmm. Discriminatory advertising or statements. You must advertise the characteristics of the property, not the characteristics of the people, to represent that the dwelling is not available because we're a protected class. Refusal to make accommodations or modifications for persons with disabilities not complying with the seven design and construction requirements, otherwise making it unavailable, or giving different terms and conditions for different people. Do we have that information about the seven design and construction requirements? I can get it to you. It's a, it's a, Lengthy. It, <laughs> I can send it out to you though. I mean, it's not something that you all would ever do anything with. Um, it would be like, that would be like a review reviewing blue plans or something. Okay. Um, the, for the commissioners, what you all would receive when it's time to review a complaint, it would be <laughs> it would be a binder that's like this thick, and it would have all of the information laid out in it, including the law. So you would just be reviewing it to say whether or not you agree with. Uh, and it, it, we hired the Department of Inspections and Appeals to conduct our hearings, um, so that administrative law just issues a decision and the commissioners are reviewing their determination to say whether you agree with it or don't agree with it or you want to amend their decision. But there is extensive uh, analysis of the issues that's already in there, so it wouldn't require you to go out and like, find the law or okay. anything. And if you had additional questions about the law, you could just ask me and then I would um, pull that information and then give it to you okay. based on what those questions are. Um, but the we, the, the, really the only time that we do things with the design and construction there is that there's a, there's a case about design and construction that we will review it. We used to review blueprints for Mobile County Housing, but we don't anymore. So um, if there's a case, it'll be outlined in the case what the, what the requirements are and where they failed in meeting those requirements. Um, so for equal terms and conditions, you can't require an additional deposit or rent from persons with disabilities or families or children except utilities paid by the landlord and there's a demonstrated increase. So let's say the landlord has a, I don't know, a four bedroom house and they used to rent it out to um, somebody that had three people living there. And then the new tenants have nine people living there. So suddenly the utilities um, that the landlord had been paying double. The landlord can increase the rent based on the utilities going up and they have to show that it, it actually went up. Can't offer move-in specials to some people but not others. Can't harass tenants or allow others to harass your tenants. Um, we see this sometimes with um, neighbor complaints. So a neighbor might be harassing someone based on a protected class and the landlord says, I'm not gonna get involved in it. That's between them. The landlord has a duty to get involved in it. If you have been, know, you've been made aware or you are aware independently that there's harassment going on, you have a duty to intervene and take action. And if the uh, complainant felt that wrongdoing was done to them, that would be filed against the landlord? Mm -hmm. okay. Is that based on the unit structure though? Like house versus house versus apartment building versus apartment building? Like if it's... Like if I own a house and I'm renting it out, the neighbor is harassing me about own that house next door, shouldn't that person call the police versus me? And that person would file against the, the neighbor instead of the landlord. Yeah. This is if... This is if you own like multi-units and you're just doing nothing about it. Or if you, like let's say you have two houses next door to each other and you own both houses. Yeah. And that's your tenant in the house next door and you have a duty to intervene. But if it's neighbor on neighbor, then they can file against that neighbor. Yeah. And if there are physical, um, if there is a physical injury for um, housing harassment, then uh, we have the authority to bring criminal charges against people for physical injuries. So we actually have a case now where someone was sexually assaulted, um, and we, that went 
we sent it to the Department of Justice to do a case, uh, to do criminal charges on the case. Um, and I, I was, that's who I was on the phone with when I walked in. I might not issue my decision on it um, and might send it to HUD because that's a area where they are doing a lot of, um, they are focusing a lot on sexual harassment cases because that's a priority of the Secretary of HUD to do, se to do sexual harassment cases. So um, the Department of Justice might take both, both of those cases. What we did was we bifurcated it. Usually it would be a one case and then you send part of it out, you send it out to the Department of Justice, they do the criminal charges, you do the civil side, um, but you have to wait on them to <laughs> accept it, and so you can't start an investigation until they accept it. Um, and because that takes so long, we bifurcated and created two separate cases, so we were doing the civil side of the case, and they were doing the criminal side, through the investigation, we found out additional information where it looks like it might be a bigger issue than the one person, so, um, rather than us taking on the, um, the uh, responsibility of a pattern of practice, it might be better for the Department of Justice or HUD to do that. Can't provide different amenities and services or apply different rules based on protected classes. The law does not protect bad behavior. So people can be evicted because of lease violations, such as non-payment of rent, continually deserving their neighbors, creating safety and health problems. So let's say the chinchilla is just pooping all up and down the hallway and just creating all sorts of mayhem. The landlord can evict that person for chinchilla pooping up and down the hallway, um, just not based on discriminatory reasons. It has to be um, something that's actually happened that would classify it as bad behavior. Bringing illegal activity into the building. So potential red flags. Mm -hmm. You would love the area. There are a lot of minorities that live there. I, I just really don't feel safe renting to a woman on the first floor. So what country were you born in? Why did you take that pill? Are you divorced? To a man. I think having your boyfriend visit might make the other tenants uncomfortable. And we have seen <clears throat> stuff like this. I mean, it's like stuff that you would think would be baseline human decency not there. Um, so this is our um, discrimination and white supremacy pyramid. So there are some things that we see and we know that they are socially unacceptable. So like lynching, hate crimes, swastikas, KKK, burning crosses, overtly racist jokes, neo-Nazis, racial slurs. Those are things that generally are socially unacceptable. They're becoming more acceptable recently for whatever reason. Um, but then there are things that are considered covert white supremacy that are socially acceptable. Um, and these are things that might violate our ordinance. So uh, hiring discrimination, discriminatory lending, racial profiling, uh, police brutality, anti-immigration policies and practices. Sometimes you'll see that employers have uh, English English only policy where people can't speak uh, whatever their native language is. Um, believing that we are post racial. Uh, having racist mascots, making uh, inappropriate comments, and then saying it's just a joke. Tokenism, a white savior complex. Not challenging racist jokes, cultural appropriation. So we just want to be mindful of these things. in. Uh, how we go about our duties and how we conduct ourselves daily. Um, good intentions, assuming that good intentions are enough. Um, sometimes we see we're saying, well, I didn't mean it that way. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter how we meant it, it matters how it was received. Um, virtuous victim narrative, denial of white privilege, denial of racism, not believing experiences of people of color, Confederate flags, seeing those here at the city, school to prison pipeline. So those are things that, um, as commissioners, we want you to be aware of and making sure that um, you're aware of these things and cognizant of interactions and challenging stereotypes and beliefs about those things. So our equal employment example. Suppose you tell your employer that you're unable to work on Sunday because your religious beliefs require you be at church. 
However, you are continually scheduled to be at work every Sunday. Is that a violation of our ordinance? Yes. Yes. That was a national news story recently. Was it? Yeah. What was it? A lady out in New York, I believe, or New Jersey. She was repeatedly scheduled to work Sundays, and she actually sued civilly, and she got a pretty good judgment. Mm -hmm. I missed that. Why do we think that's a violation of the ordinance? It's a protected class. Um, what do you call it? Religion. Religion. Yeah. But can't your employer make you work whatever days they need you to? Well, they can, but no. if you've already informed your employer that, you know, you're required to be at church based on your religion. I think it's the fact that it's continual, and you would have to show proof that there are no others that could work on those Sundays. Okay. Anybody else? I would wonder, well, what, <laughs> what am I doing here? Sunday because of the, the, the. So it says yes, or I can't accept that, and then you have a choice. <clears throat> I, you know, it depends, right? So it, it would be <coughs> a reasonable accommodation based on your religion. <clears throat> so if they have a policy where people rotate Sundays, um, but you can't work rotate Sundays because of your religious beliefs, then they have to give you an accommodation based on your religion. Um, to not work Sundays. So that's how it comes under our ordinance. By failing to give that accommodation, um, it becomes a violation of the ordinance. Suppose you are a 62-year-old female dental assistant from Germany. The dentist you work for is very interested in your German heritage and continually asks you questions in front of patients like, what was it like to live under Hitler? When you change the subject, he gets physical and shoves a chair into your shins. I think it's a violation. So, yeah, it would violate the ordinance um, based on national origin. Probably also a crime to hit yeah. someone with a chair. <laughs> Suppose you are deaf or hard of hearing. You told your supervisor you were unable to hear during a recent safety training. Three weeks later, you were fired because you weren't following safety protocol. Has there been a violation of the ordinance? Yes. yes. Why is that? It's a reasonable accommodation that could be made or should be made. For? For the employee to hear the instructions. I mean, whether it's giving them a louder or microphone, not microphone, headphones, whatever it may be, you need to make sure they get the instructions. And they're being fired because of something because. that they didn't know about mm -hmm. um, because of the failure to accommodate. Mm -hmm. So in 2017, EOC had 84,154 charges in the U.S. It is illegal to discriminate in employment, including hiring and firing, compensation, assignment or classification, transfer, promotion, layoff or recall, job advertisements, recruiting, testing, use of company facilities, training and apprenticeship programs, fringe benefits, pay, retirement plans, disability leave, imposing different terms and conditions, any of the other terms and conditions of employment? So discriminatory practices include harassment, retaliation, employment decisions based on stereotypes or assumptions. So this would be considered harassment. Uh, we actually had a case where uh, a lady, she had a, um, uh, <coughs> one of the IBS with a, uh, a disability similar to that and it would require her to use the bathroom frequently. And so they, and 
and she spoke a different, I can't remember what language, she spoke a different language, her parents were immigrants. And she would call her parents and speak whatever language they spoke. And so they asked her to stop speaking that language because they didn't know what she was talking about. They were concerned. And then they walled her off from the rest of her coworkers because they were able to hear her conversations with her parents. And then they started recording every time she went to the bathroom. So she, they were making her flock in and out every time she went to the bathroom. Um, and that was obviously the founded case where it seems like they are harassing her based on her disability and national group. Suppose you are a person with a physical disability. You need to go to the bank to sign paperwork only to find out that when you arrive, there is no way to get in. So we have that nice step there in the photo mm -hmm. for the violation of the ordinance. Mm -hmm. Failure to provide reasonable accommodation. Or an accessible entrance. Yeah. So a uh, place of public accommodation should have a way for people to enter and exit um, that would comply with the ADA. Suppose you are a gay man out to dinner with your partner celebrating your recent job promotion. You and your partner share a kiss and the manager immediately comes to your table and asks you to leave. Actually, happened to one of our former commissioners. Is this a violation of the ordinance? Yes. Yes. How does that guy show up? Discrimination based off of sexual orientation. So, I mean, do you get complaints against consumers? I mean, consumers against establishments? Mm -hmm. I think they go on to report it a lot. They probably do. Um, and then there is an issue with witnesses. Most yeah. people don't know to go and like get other people's information so they can contact them as a witness. So it could be just one person's word against the other. What is a public accommodation? Public accommodations are generally defined as entities, both public and private, that are used by the public. So places of public accommodation include government buildings and services, restaurants, hotels, theaters, doctor's offices, pharmacies, retail stores, museums, libraries, parks, private schools, and daycare centers. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the legislation that outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin. It ended racial segregation in schools, at the workplace, and by facilities that serve the general public. Discrimination is rarely blatant. It's usually cleverly disguised. Mm -hmm. An adverse action has to have occurred because of a protected class or in retaliation for engaging in protected activity. I've been discriminated against now, but so if you can contact our office, we have a complaint. Our jurisdiction is for the city of Davenport. For housing, it has to be filed in one year. For every other area, it has to be within 300 days. We do also um, help people with complaints if it's something that has occurred outside of the city of Davenport. So with our contracts with HUD and EEOC, we get paid for people who um, file complaints here in our office. Um, the minimal amount, but something better than that. So we um, assist with filling out the complaint. Um, for EEOC, they can come in and sign it and then we send it off to the EEOC and it gets filed there. For HUD, it's a similar process. Um, DCRC is a neutral investigative agency and does not provide legal advice. Again, we do not provide legal advice, but we do do education on civil rights protections. So we do trainings. Um, people can give us hypos and, and, tra and trainings to get more um, specific information about things that may or may not violate our ordinance. We usually shy away from uh, answering uh, very specific questions when people call, <laughs> call the office to say, you know, this just happened, is, is this illegal? You know, we usually shy away from answering those specific questions, but during a training, if somebody gives us a hypothetical, we can uh, kind of go through and explain why or why not that might violate the ordinance. Complainants will be expected to cooperate and actively participate in the process. If we can't help you, we do try to find an appropriate referral agency. So people come into our office all the time with 
issues that are not necessarily civil rights issues. Um, and we figure out what agency would probably be best to help them. So we do a lot of referrals to legal aid um, or the Department of Labor, um, to the city's um, health department uh, for, um, for housing for inspections if there are things relating to like a sound board. Um, sometimes the Department of Justice. Some of it might just be um, something that's outside of our jurisdiction. So whatever agency would be best to help with that. Davenport sexual harassment case. So we had this case a few years ago. The landlord, he was renting to women who had nowhere else to go. And then if they had difficulty paying the rent, he propositioned them. He touched them inappropriately, kissed them, would be great for them. Um, he offered them to clean to work off rent, and then he would corner them. Um, that case. We found a uh, probable cause. The landlord then filed for bankruptcy. Um, the bankruptcy court made an order that um, the complainant was to receive $35,000 in damages, $25,000 in attorney's fees, and a $10,000 civil penalty. Um, and I think this case, I want to say it was cross filed with the Iowa Civil Rights Commission because I think that um, Attorney General said that, and they prevented him from being on the This is a very great picture on this screen. I'm sure you can see the gradation and the colors really well. <laughs> so employment is, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you can't see it there at all. The employment is a very large area, like two thirds, and then next is housing and public accommodation, um, education. And then the, the little area that you actually can not see is transit. Um, so. We don't investigate transit cases, but we are the Title VI coordinator for the city. So if people file complaints um, relating to transit, we end up being mediations for them. If it is not resolved in mediation, then um, that goes to the Department of Transportation. Um, as a result of the mediations, we do follow up with making sure that the parties have complied with the agreement. So it could be a training that we provide as a result of mediation or change of policy or something. So this would be buses, taxi cabs, anything like that under transit? City buses. City buses. Federally funded. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the protected classes that the cases have been filed in. So race and disability are the big ones. Then retaliation. People just can't resist. So for this was last year's statistics, we had $131,000 in monetary damages, as well as changes to policies and procedures that resulted in a significant positive impact for the community at large. This year, our recovery is higher. I can't remember the exact number, though. So additional roles of um, ECRC. So we collaborate with community groups, advising them of their rights, and interacting with law enforcement. That's the DCAP thing. We, um, serve as an independent agency for people to submit internal affairs complaints to the uh, DAPR Police Department. Uh, we work as a community liaison for civil rights related issues. We used to review plans with public works to provide recommendations to builders, architects, and landlords to ensure accessibility in retail business and, and multifamily housing. Sometimes we still get uh, contacts directly from landlords and, and commercial um, people who want to have us uh, give them some insight on whether or not they are um, making their, their uh, facility accessible and complying with the law. The worst thing to have happen is you build something or you remodel something and then you find <coughs> out the next day that it's not accessible and you have to change it. Um, we work with the ADA coordinator to ensure ADA compliance with city facilities, including sidewalks. On a I want to touch base on the monetary awards. Mm -hmm. In the annual report on page nine, in 2013, the bar is huge. Oh well, yeah. The and of, what, and what? that person did that themselves. The, the guy was a, he was a high-ranking employee somewhere. Okay. And they fired him. And 
I want to say he got like two hundred thousand uh, dollars. Okay. It was uh, one case that made it skyrocket. Yeah. Okay. And every year, uh, for context, every year after that, it's so, fell by like two thirds. Yeah. Okay. He, it was that was one person. Yeah. He, uh, Interesting. I, I, yeah, he was. He was. I want to say like a CEO or some super high ranking employee, mm -hmm. and he was fired for discriminatory reasons, and he got a huge uh, settlement. Um, and usually, if it's if it's something where it's kind of blatant, um, employers try to settle really quickly before it goes further because it, if it becomes public, it damages their reputation. Uh, or else it could just be expensive to hire attorneys to go through the whole process. So uh, we do the bias trainings for community members. So we do like a training called Iowa Nice. Um, that Iowa isn't so nice. To brown people <laughs> so well, we talk a lot about that uh, people understanding their bias uh, we did the fair housing symposium we do the back to school drive every year um, we do train for the community as, re as requested uh, employment law diversity fair housing ADA compliance um, our staff serves as an active member of the care so being there is a resource to answer questions about things um, help people figure out how to have things be accessible is, is really helpful in a proactive way. So hopefully everybody got an underst a better understanding of fair housing and employment public accommodation, learning ways to recognize discrimination. And this encourages you all to come and file complaints in our office. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but if other people um, tell you about things that would be a violation of the ordinance, um, notify them that we are here as a resource. And these are just, like I said, like a 40,000 foot view. So if you have additional questions, contact us. If there are things that you want to learn more about specifically, contact me. And then we can do a, a more specific training. Um, we go over the handbook. Um, so has everybody had a chance to review it? Mm -hmm. um, our annual report that's in here is old, so we are we usually have our annual report done by now. Um, but our staff member who does it goes out, so we are finishing up on the one for this year. Um, we have the ordinance. Does everybody have an opportunity to review the ordinance? For the most part. And then, most part. <laughs> and then we have the guidelines for commissioners, groups, and section six. for the commissioners to be knowledgeable about the ordinance, review and make decisions on issues presented to the commission in compliance with the law, uh, with the ultimate goal of protecting the public, be aware that commission members are viewed as representatives of the commission when they appear, when they appear at public meetings and professional gatherings. Commission members should not speak for the commission unless they were specifically authorized to do so. That is no restriction on you speaking for yourself. Um, not to participate in a discussion or vote on any matter in which the commission member has a personal or professional conflict of interest. Examples of cases in which a conflict of interest may exist are set forth below. The commission member has a question as to whether a conflict of interest exists in this particular case. That member should contact the commission staff for further advice. A commission member is in a position to receive business or personal gain or loss as a result of the commission decision. For instance, a conflict may exist if a commission member has a social relationship or any other relationship with a person or entity being investigated by the commission. A commission member is an employee, director, trustee, officer, or board member of an agency, institution, or organization, including a professional organization, which might receive a benefit or loss as a result of an action taken or a decision made by the commission. Even if an actual conflict of interest does not exist, a commission member's participation in a commission decision could create the appearance of impropriety. Note, a commission member who cannot participate in a particular commission decision because of a conflict of interest should leave the room during the discussion of the issue or case and ensure that the minutes of the meeting reflect the recusal. 
prepare for the commission meetings by reviewing the materials before the meetings, to become educated regarding the Davenport Civil Rights Ordinance and attend education programming offered by the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, EEOC and HUD when possible, and any other organizations that address civil rights issues. Discuss issues honestly and demonstrate flexibility by presenting options for the commission decision making. In contested cases, a commission member must maintain absolute confidentiality regarding closed session deliberations. Commissioners shall not engage in ex parte communications with any person, including the respondent, respondent's attorney, or any other person about any issue or fact or law in a contested case. Ex parte communications are communications between a commissioner and another person without notice and opportunity for all parties to participate. Local and state law prohibits commissioners from discussing any information concerning a contested case with a person outside of the commission. Commissioners should not consider any information in reaching a decision in a contested case except for the testimony and exhibits in the hearing. <coughs> Primary duties of the commissioners include proposing regulations, amendments, or rescissions of the Dapp Court Civil Rights Ordinance are necessary to carry out the purpose of the ordinance, plan or conduct for the purpose of eliminating plan or conduct programs for the purpose of eliminating discrimination based on the protected classes provided in the ordinance, attend monthly meetings as scheduled by the commission, perform any other duties authorized by the commission, necessary and appropriate to effectuate the purposes of the ordinance, make determinations as to whether discrimination claims should proceed to public hearing, review and recommend the decision of the administrative law judge after he or she has rendered a decision in a case that has been heard at a public hearing, may be required to hear oral arguments as part of the commission's review of the administrative law judge's recommended decision, adopt, modify, or reject the administrative law judge's recommended decision, or remand the case to the judge for taking additional evidence, issue the final order, order that the commission feels will further the purpose of the Davenport Civil Rights Ordinance in cases that proceed to public hearing, attend education programming for the, provided by the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, the EEOC, HUD, and any other organizations that relate to civil rights issues, of meeting procedures, if you kind of got those, they are the second Tuesday of every month, held in the conference room, to, held in this room, that you just left for an hour, hour and a half. If you're unable to attend the meeting, please notify staff. The agenda minutes of the previous meeting and case status reports, the record reports are, are sent to everybody before the meeting. Please read the minutes to make note of any questions or corrections that you have. Remember to keep the, the uh, minutes confidential as they are unapproved at this point and not a public record. Each meeting, the chairperson will ask for the approval of the minutes. If the minutes are approved as distributed, you will not receive another copy. The initial copy becomes your final copy. The approved minutes are forwarded to the city deputy clerk for public record. For that process, we post them online. Um, a copy of all minutes is kept in the commission office, delivered to the city council liaison, and posted on the commission's website. After the minutes are approved, then there's an opportunity for public comment and presentation. Next page is our code of ethics and conduct for elected officials and members of appointed boards and commissions. I have a question regarding the meetings. Do we usually meet here mm -hmm. or over there? No, here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought we were going to put that on the agenda as yeah. far as. It's, uh, yeah, it, it seems like the air is off in the building. It's not usually this this warm. Especially if we're going to have public. Yeah, it's 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 in here. <clears throat> the meetings were voted to not be over there because the commissioners did not want to have the meetings recorded and put on the city website because they are not accessible. Um, and so that, and they've always been here. But that was the reason why they were not over there. They are now. Because when I was at the Housing Commission, our meetings are recorded. When you were? In the Housing Commission. Um, right. They, so each board or commission has the authority to decide how they want their meetings conducted. So they don't have to authorize the city to record the meetings. So individuals, members of the public, can come in and record meetings if they want to. But that's different than the city recording them and posting them online. And because they are not captioned, it creates a separate mm -hmm. issue, accessibility. Um, for the, I'm sorry to be speaking so fast, I just have another meeting. 
question after this one. Um, for the next one, the state of purpose, obviously we want to make sure that um, public officials, both elected and appointed, comply with both the letter and the spirit of laws and policies affecting the operation of government. Public officials should be independent, they should be impartial, and they should be fair in their judgment and actions. Public office is to be used for the public good, not for your personal gain. Public de deliberations and processes must be conducted openly unless they are legally confidential in an atmosphere of respect and civility to those ends and to assure public confidence in the integrity of local government and its effective and fair operation. The City Council adopted this code of ethics and conduct for all of the elected officials and the members of appointed boards, commissions, and committees. So, the first one is that there's an expectation that you act in the public interest. The next one is that you comply with the law. The next one is that their professional and personal conduct of members must be above reproach um, and avoid even the appearance of impropriety. Members shall refrain from abusive conduct, personal charges, or brutal attacks upon the character and motives of other members with that for the public. Um, it gets a little tricky because it's First Amendment issues. So, if you just want a uh, thirty thousand foot, be professional. Uh, respect for process. Members shall perform their duties in accordance with the processes and rules of order established by the council or pertinent boards, commissions, and committees. Conduct of public meetings. Prepare for public issues. Listen courteously and attentively, and to all relevant public discussions before the body, and focus on the business at hand. Refrain from interrupting other speakers from personal comments or speeches not germane to the business of the body. Otherwise, interfering with the order of the conduct. Make sure decisions are based on merit and substance of the matter at hand. Uh, share all substantive information that is relevant to a matter under consideration, whether or not received from so sources outside the public decision-making process. Make sure that there are no conflict of interest shouldn't use your official positions to influence government decisions. You are required to comply with the Iowa gift law, which is please get accept any gifts over $3. Uh, make sure that you respect the confidentiality of information concerning city property, personnel, or proceedings of the city. Should not disclose confidential information without proper legal authorization nor use the information to advance the personal interests. Make sure that you're not using public resources that are not available to the public in general, such as city staff time, equipment, or supplies or facilities for private gain or personal purposes. So if you have access to something by virtue of your role as a commissioner that um, your public wouldn't have access to, you can't use it for your personal um, gain or personal purposes. Uh, representation of private interests, private interests, keeping their role as in keeping with their role as stewards of the public interest, shouldn't be the shouldn't appear on behalf of private interests or third parties uh, before the council or any board, commissioner, or committee, or proceeding of the city. Nor shall members of boards, commissions, and committees appear before their own bodies or before the council on behalf of the private interests of third parties on matters relating to the areas of service of their bodies. So let's say that an elected official contacts one of the commissioners to say, hey, one of my donors has a case filed against them. I want you to decide on it this way. That would be a violation of the code of ethics, um, and that would be an uh, them representing private interests. Advocacy. Members shall represent the official policies or positions of the city board commission or, or committee to the best of their ability when designated as delegates for this purpose. When presenting their individual opinions and positions, members shall explicitly state that they do not represent the body or the city of Davenport, nor will they allow the inference that they do. The policy role of members shall respect and adhere to the council administrative st structure of city government as outlined in the city ordinances. Follow the municipal code with respect to the administrator's relationship with the council. Is everybody, um, does everybody understand the the uh, the uh, structure of our office in relation to the council? And uh, the you're mm -hmm. 
I think the flow chart is actually pretty good. Yeah. One of the last pages. So, what is it, seven? No. Eight. Yeah, there it goes. So, our, our office is separate from the city administration. Commissioners, the council confirms those appointments, and then the seven commissioners are over the office. So the mayor is the um, ultimate supervisor of the commissioners. With this being an independent board, the mayor does not should not be interfering with your decision making. If there is an issue with the way that you are performing your duties, as far as like Matt Beeson's in office, that's where the mayor should intervene. Anything that is not that, the mayor should not be. <coughs> attempting to influence your decision making and neither should any council members. Um, so we are separate from the city and that this is an independent board. Um, the staff that works here works under the board. Um, we are subjected to the legislative direction of council in that they draft our ordinance and that they give us appropriations and so we are to administer the funds uh, in, in accordance with what the commission decides as long as it's within those parameters of the of the um, budget that we have so I know we have a little bit of a unique structure and some people don't understand how that structure works so I just want to make sure that we are all aware that that is the and that has been some of the contention recently with the commission and not understanding their role as an independent body how they are separate from the city government and that has been um, so Obviously, I became made aware from Facebook that there was, there were communications that uh, individuals have had with city staff as far as the role of the city's legal department in relation to the commission. And so, as a result of that, I printed out, oh, did I lose them? I printed out the legal ordinance. Did this appear on it? Yeah. There we go. I highlighted the relevant oh, portions yeah. for, for everybody so that they would be aware of the role of the legal department in relation to the commission. Um, so obviously we are there are seven this this one? Yeah. Yeah. It's still yours. It's super tiny writing too. Um, but the legal department is there for the mayor, city council, and city administrator. Um, and so that was some of the discussion that we had at the last meeting where as a parent we all were contacted by the legal department and we told that the legal department represents you. And that's not um, what the so let me ask you something then. So what what is what is he doing here? Why is he at the meeting? Why is he putting placards out? If he's if he's a, a city attorney, then he shouldn't have anything to do with any of that, right? I think no. um, we're gonna we have a section dedicated for public comment. I appreciate oh, your input. I'm sorry, I did kind of say people could ask. Sorry. Um, let's, go ahead, <laughs> let's just go ahead and try to stick to the yeah. agenda. We're not. I'm not skipping over it. We'll come back to it. Let's just. Oh yeah, we'll definitely come back to it. Uh, I'll bring it up in the public speaking part. I'm sorry, I didn't say that anybody could chime in and if they have a question. Um, but yeah, so that that is the role of the legal department. I act as the commission's attorney. Um, so if there are questions regarding legal matters, those come to me. If I don't know the answer to it, I usually go, if it's a procedural matter that would be like a, a city government's issue, then I go to Tom Warner, who's the corporation counsel, and ask him if I don't know the answer to it. Um, you all don't know me well yet, but I'm uh, very open to saying that I don't know something. I don't know the answer to something. Um, so that is the role there, and that's kind of the separation. Um, yeah, and, and it, it specifically says, in any prosecution for violation of any regulation adopted by any board or commission created under the authority of the council, which our commission is, the legal department shall act under the direction of such board or commission. And that's 240-20-K. So that's to prosecute people. So if the commission were to ask the legal department to prosecute a case where it has found cause, then the, the legal department should do that at the direction of the commission. The commission is not acting at the direction of the legal department. 
Um, and if there are actions brought by or against a city officer in his official capacity, the city's legal department would prosecute and defend any actions or proceedings. That does not make them your attorneys. Um, that would just be if you were, like let's say a respondent or a complainant said, I think that this individual commissioner was biased in the way that they issued that decision, I'm suing them. Then the city's legal department would come in and possibly either in, as themselves provide legal advice or counsel or they would hire as outside counsel for you because you're being accused of misconduct in your official duties. Um, and so that's kind of that separation between the office and the other city departments. Um, independence of boards, commissions, and committees. So because of this, um, the um, public decision-making process to refrain from using the, their position to influence unduly the deliberations or outcomes of board, commission, and committee proceedings should maintain a positive work environment. So should support the maintenance of a positive and constructive workplace environment for city employees, for citizens and businesses dealing with the city. Members shall recognize their special role in the dealings with the city employees and refrain from creating the perception of an inappropriate direction of staff. Um, the implementation, so the city of Davenport Code of Ethics is intended to be self-enforcing, so they are expecting people to basically operate on an honor code and not violate this policy. Compliance and, and enforcement, so if you um, are violating the ethical conduct expected for ele elected officials and appointed officials, um, you have the primary responsibility to ensure that um, the standards are understood and met so that the public can maintain a uh, full confidence and integrity in their government. The chairs of boards, commissions, and committees and mayor have the additional responsibility <coughs> to intervene when members of the actions appear to be in violation of the code of ethics and conduct. The city council by a supermajority may a supermajority vote may impose sanctions on members whose conduct does not comply with these standards or other rules, protocols, or standards, including reprimand, form of censure, loss of seniority, or committee reassignment, and recommendation for removal under Iowa law. The uh, city council also may recommend removal of members of boards, commissions, and committees. So the final page is a statement of commitment for signature. Um, I can provide copies of this that are outside of the book for the next meeting for people to sign. But I would ask that everybody review it, make sure that they agree with it, and be prepared to sign it. The next thing is the ethics and responsibilities for commissioners. Did everybody have a chance to review that one on their own? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there is a board and commissions member update. So we do try to keep this information in our office. Um, our ordinance specifically states that our commissioners should be broadly representative of uh, uh, social, cultural groups, racial groups within our city. Um, so when we lose commissioners, we try to make sure that we are um, replacing them with people who have a protected class or a part of the group that is missing from the commission. So we don't want our commission to be homogenous. We want there to be a diversity of people and a diversity of things on the commission. So we try to keep um, track of that. And then um, in ideal circumstances, there's open communication with the mayor. And um, we advise them of who's missing as far as the, the groups. Um, and then they try to look at somebody that fits those, those groups. The next one is questions and answers about open meetings. So if there are questions about that. I had a chance to review that. So, and this was the concern with the meeting that was scheduled over there um, because there's discussions about what goes on in the agenda. It's a discussion about an action item, and if it's a discussion of an action item, it should be in an open meeting. Um, if I have any questions about it, I was made aware that you all received an email about changing your email addresses to use city email addresses. Um, I think that that's something that probably needs to be voted on by the commission, so we should probably add that to the agenda um, for the June meeting. 
in the past, communications with commissioners comes through our office. So I am not sure what is happening with why you all are being contacted outside of that process, but it creates a communication issue because we don't know what's going on. And then we are learning after the fact that you all have been contacted about things. So have you all been contacted by anyone else about different changes or? I, um, just to be clear, I made the request to have, to not use my personal email. Mm -hmm. uh, I just was trying to keep business and, and personal life separate. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told it wasn't an issue. Okay. Yeah, I thought you would get that automatically, actually. No, Go I, got, I, I got it after you all got it, just to say that you all had been sent something to give you a, so. So you've been provided with all our emails? But nobody has told me that that's what, I mean, in the past, what we do is measures use their personal email, and if they want to deviate from that, that it may be an action for the commissioners to discuss of whether that's what they want to do. Oh, um, and it would be good. Can, you know, make, can we get something down for the next So year? basically what she's saying is you can't just come up and say, hey, we want emails, that you, you violated a, a, a you know, thing there by doing that well, is again, what she's saying. I just I didn't look like you were getting it, and I just let you know. So, um, yeah. So, have there been any other things that uh, we should be made aware of that are? And in the future, you can contact us, and then we contact them to say okay. they want we want to create an email address sure. for them, sure. and then IT would create an email address. Um, I, the contention is coming from things changing and we're not made aware of it until after the fact and so we don't know exactly what's going on so I don't I don't recall giving my email to to the office here it's on the application so okay. they gave us the um, application so you're saying even to update that that has to be something that we have to discuss that would come you would update it with us because we would be there's no, there would be a very rare circumstance where someone outside of the office would be contacting you. So we would be the parties that would be contacting you about meetings and things related to the role. So okay. to update it, you would just call us and say, hey, I want to change my email address. Gotcha. And then we would change it. Um, but to, to change that all of the commissioners are now going to have city email addresses, I think that would be something that the commission would decide that they want to do differently. Um, because if you have a city email address, then you also need to be made aware of the responsibilities that come along with the city email address and that it's public, but people are going to be contacting you and how to respond to things and if you should be responding to individual things that are sent to you at the city email address. Okay. And, and checking it. So I is, would somebody emails you and then is, um, is there another training that we can have? About? Uh, how to operate under the subsets of having about the oak records oh, well yeah. I think about the city email address you're saying there's separate rules for that I think that's what you're asking yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you mean you mean for how to create a city email or how to operate with the city email as far as it being a public record operate so uh, like a chapter Do we want to do that at the next meeting? Yes. Yeah, as soon as possible. And I could also just, I could send out information about it uh, beforehand, just so that you have it, to be aware of it, um, and then we could have discussions about it. Anything else for the June meeting? So what, what do we have down for the agenda for June meeting? Roll call, approval of agenda, mm -hmm. new business. I got resolution, emails, email addresses, chapter 22. And there was something from the from the last meeting that we pushed it. There was the approval of agenda of the, the minutes. minutes. Old, the old, min uh -huh. old minutes. There were a couple things from the last meeting that are on that are pushed for the agenda for June. 
from CNOW, I can't remember exactly. Do <laughs> you want to put those well, on there for the new, want to address those? Yes. Okay. There okay. was the topic of rescinding the order the resolutions. Yeah, that's the resolution. She has that on Resolution, okay. All right. Meeting room. Oh, the meeting room, yeah. And will you send us the, basically, what we were going to look at as far as the meeting minutes we did not approve last time? Will you send that to us again? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I and think prior else? to that, too. Yeah, prior to the yeah. prior to the next meeting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, everything yeah. that needs to be approved so we can review it. Or yes, that's what that's, I'm that's in the agenda packet. Okay, all right. You said you'll send us a link to that video. So you know, okay. Yeah. And I, I do have a 2.30 I have to get to, but I mean, is that anything else for an agenda? Well, this gentleman I know, that's what, before we go to public comment, I don't know, if, Michael, do you have anything else we have? Yeah, that's all the items that I had. Are you good mm -hmm. At this time, we can go ahead and move on over to public comment. Okay, first of all, I, I, will, I would like to know, you know, if, if this can be answered, why the city attorney is is attending the meeting, putting out name name plates and, and different things like that. that. Why why is that happening? Can, um, just for the record, can you go in and just state your name? Brian Winger. Can anybody answer that for me? I saw him here as, as a member of the public. So, Latrice, is it normal for a member of the public to, to come and, and put out name tags for the Civil Rights Commission members? And, and is that something that normally happens? Or? No. Okay. All right. It just seemed kind of out of you know, the place of a, of a civil rights meeting that the city attorney comes down and he's placing cards, you know, it just, he's very out of place here and I, I think it's a total, total just violation of everything that, that he's doing this because obviously somebody from up there has been in contact with you guys about something and, and there's just a whole big gray area there. It's really, really bad. May, may the, I every, the whole thing looks bad, and let me tell you. May I ask you something? Sure. What is the concern of him being here? Because it's it's out of the ordinary. It's not something that's ever happened before in a civil rights commission commission meeting that I've ever been to before. That the city attorney's down here putting putting name name plates out for you know different members and stuff like that. I didn't I didn't see that the the person that was sitting here he didn't have a name plate out. Latrice doesn't have a name plate out. That doesn't seem out of the ordinary to you. No. Nope. Does it, it does to me? No. That's because you've never attended a civil rights commission meeting before, have you? before you became part of the Civil Rights Commission. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so the first, first thing I want to do is I want to apologize to all my friends that I didn't check what I'm about to check right now in the last meeting. That it was, I, I, I apologize. So a citizen wrote a very inspiring and revealing speech about what was going on here, the vetting process and more. After she was done, Ms. Gilman over there asked her if she wrote the speech. Very, oh, that's just that, that's terrible. Was that, you know, that, that, I, was that I, very again, articulate? again, I, I think you missed the I think you missed the the diamond thing that she had up there, the pyramid thing that she had up there. Recheck that. Okay. So, you know, and, and the reason you did that because you know in your head you were like, wow, she wrote that. You know, for a black woman to write that, that's amazing. And, and I know you're going to say that's not the context she did that in, but again refer to the pyramid. All right, so, you know, and you also asked where she worked at, which I don't know why that had a bearing on anything. That really doesn't really, doesn't matter where, where a person works. A person that comes and speaks in public, what does it matter where they work at? What if, what if she was homeless? That was interesting. Okay, it, but it doesn't matter. No. It, it's not a question that, yeah. that a civil rights commissioner should be asking, um, just so you know. Okay. Sir, I'm gonna ask that you address the commission as a whole. Sure. Okay, so this is very off, um, offensive and degrading to people of color when they do something that would be normal for a white person to do, then after they do it, someone says, oh, did you write that yourself? It's a form of white supremacy. It's terrible. It's hard enough to get up here and speak. I have terrible anxiety. I hate getting up and speaking like this. I can't imagine how it was for her. 
So for you to be an actual person on the Civil Rights Commission of the city of Davenport and act like that to a person of color shows why you shouldn't be on the Civil Rights Commission. <coughs> then Mr. G oh, well, please. Then another member of the commission had a prepared statement for the, the media afterwards. And in his prepared statement, he, uh, he said he didn't, he didn't seem to know the difference between marginal and marginalized, which just for, for, you know, for somebody to be on a civil rights commission and, and have a prepared statement and say marginal instead of marginalized, it, it just shows you, you know, just the, the context of everything that's going on here right now. Um, you know, you, you, you did that, and, and the reason that you did that, and you know the difference between marginal and marginalized, I know you all do, and, and the reason he did that is just to, show, again, show his white supremacy over, you know, the whole situation. Now, I'm, so I've been making notes as I've been going along the meeting here today. The understanding part of the portion of this meeting today was horrifying. The simple things that you all missed, I was just shaking my head the entire time. Um, you know, one person was, was defending landlords and, you know, somebody, somebody else didn't know that, that, you know, discrimination against religion is, is not a thing that, you need, that, that can be done. Um, you know, it was just, it was all horrifying. I understand you're all new, but, you know, there was just some simple things there that, that you know, you should, you should just know. Um, so, you know, I, it goes back to how do I tell my LGBTQ daughter or any of my other, other marginalized friends if they get discriminated against, if they can just go down to the city hall and file a complaint. I'm sure the guy that doesn't know the word marginalized to a point will help you. What a joke that would be. Just about the same joke as those two appointments are to the commission. Your roles as commissioner are supposed to be ambassadors for civil rights. What both of you did was opposite of that. This is a citizen of Davenport vetting these two appointments. It's going to be a hard no from the citizens of Davenport. I'm calling for both of you to resign immediately and for the mayor and city council to appoint properly vetted and qualified candidate, candidates to the commission. Thank you, sir. Any other members of the public? Sir? Yeah. I guess I would just like to say, um, Two things. One is, um, I'm sorry, sir. my name is Dan Foley. I live in the fourth ward. Um, there's two things I'd like to say. One is that um, the the part where we were talking about the interaction between landlords and and tenants earlier in this meeting was pretty alarming to me. Landlords are rich and powerful people. They have their own organization that advocates for them. Renters have nobody. They have you guys. That's your job. You're, you're supposed to be thinking like tenants, not like landlords. Okay, that's the one thing I want to say. The other thing is, the statement that was read by the, the person in the public at the last meeting, um, we talked about that a little bit, but there was also a lot of content in that statement. And I'm wondering, is anything being done about any of that stuff? It was like a four or five page statement. I would have, if I had a copy of it, I'd read it. I, the, the commissioners that were here did get a copy of it. So I would just like to see some of the concerns in that statement addressed, if it's if if it's uh, makes sense to do that in here. Some of the stuff had to do with the dispute about uh, the commissioners, who's who belongs on here or whatever, but not all of it. So there's some stuff in here I think you guys should should address from that statement. Thank you. Yeah, if I can say one more thing, I think that the letter that the, that she read at the last commission meeting should be made public in some way if all of you have copies of it and you know she did say it in a public forum that that it needs to be made public in some way that way everybody can see it and you know as he said what whatever things that were in there that need to be done as part as like the vetting process and things like that that were not done in this situation at all that really needs to be addressed and it should be addressed by you it should have been one of the things on, on the things hey we need to address what she talked about nobody said nothing not one of y'all Sad, really is. It's telling about every one of you that nobody said nothing about that. I, it will be included in the minutes packet after it's approved by. Okay. Because it was she submitted it to. Okay. <clears throat> Any other members of the public that speak this time? I'm going to call this meeting to a close. Did we set the date of the last? I'm sorry.
sorry? June 4th, June 11th. We're going to go to the regular cycle. Yep, we're back on track with uh, June 11th. So the meeting on June 11th is still here, since we have not approved.